Happy Fourth of July! <laughs> what? <laughs> I missed it again? Okay, listen, it's just that I'm super busy, and <gasps> this is more of a hobby. I have a job, I have bills, whatever. It's fine. You wanna know why? Because this is America. And although we do indeed have a specific day in which we celebrate the independence of this great nation from British tyranny, we just don't ever get the message. Because the 4th of July seems to be many days leading up to and after the 4th. So like a teenager who just found a forgotten box of Roman candles and maybe illegal fireworks their dad bought on a reservation, I'm going to release this way later than I should be. I wanted to do something for this fourth, as I typically just go watch the fireworks and then go about my life. I brainstormed a few ideas. Star Spangled Banner explained? Nah, overdone. Or as one of my history professors put it so elegantly, and this is not a joke, unoriginal history. Yep, that's what he called historical works on important historical events. Anyway, then I thought maybe explaining what the fourth is actually celebrating. Boring. Maybe the history of barbecue? Interesting, certainly, though I don't know how interesting others would find it. Then it hit me. What is one thing that even people outside the US think about when they think of a blue-blooded, true-hearted American patriot? <coughs> guns. Now going over the history of guns could be an entire field in and of itself. That being said, there are plenty of those who are far more knowledgeable in the history of firearms, and there are 10 times that number of people who think they know the same as the experts. I'm already neck deep in one community where that is very true. So today, we will be talking about an American brand that has captured the hearts and minds of children for five decades with one of America's favorite pastimes. This is the history of Nerf. Now, many may think that Nerf's history starts somewhere like here, the children of World War II and Korean veterans arming themselves just as their fathers before them to protect the family yard from the evil communists. Or perhaps here with the famous Red Rider pellet gun, a safe alternative to handing a child a firearm. However, these guesses would be further from the truth. In fact, Nerf's origins begin here. The family game that broke your dad's back and made you question to what extent does your human soul need to be attached to your feeble corporeal form. This is Rain Geyer. He was born in 1935 and is a native of St. Paul, Minnesota. Go Vikings! Geyer's career began after he sold his hit success Twister to Milton Bradley in 1967. Geyer was the co-owner of an in-store display business, which his father had started back in 1956. If any of you know what the hell an in-store display business is, please leave a comment below. Geyer, invigorated by his recent success with Twister and passionate about developing family-friendly games, struck a deal with his father. In exchange for space in his business to start his own company, Geyer offered to relinquish co-ownership and half of the proceeds from Twister royalties. He was elated when his father accepted the deal. Geyer created Windsor Concepts in an empty warehouse he had purchased for his father's business four years prior. The space was far too big for the small team he had assembled, but he made it work. The space was all built by hand to match an environment ripe for game creation. A comfortable meeting room, a workroom, workshop with tools, and the rest of the warehouse was an open floor for unobscured playtesting of new ideas. After eight months, the team at Windsor Concepts had developed such. Norton Cross, a game developer at the company, scheduled an afternoon testing of a new game he had in the works. The game was pretty interesting. The foundation of the game was similar to Twister in that the players were the game pieces. The game's theme was centered around early man. Plastic sheets resembling stepping stones would be placed onto the floor. Each player had coins, which they could hide underneath the stepping stones, and two foam rocks. The aim of the game, by the sound of it, was to collect as many coins as possible. A player could stop another player from stealing their coins hidden underneath the stones by throwing the foam rocks at them. Seriously, when I described this game to some friends, they all wanted this to be a thing. Anyway, the most logical outcome transpired. As the testing began to dissolve, colleague Will Cruz took some of the foam rocks and started to pelt them at fellow company members. An all-out foam rock-throwing war ensued. 
As the dust settled and the laughter subsided, the five grown men suddenly realized that they had hit gold. A cardinal parental rule had just been shattered. No throwing balls in the house. Over the course of the foam-fueled war, nobody was injured. This opened many doors. Testing of the foam happened soon after finding a distributor who sold it as padding for shipping. They tried different sized balls and at different densities. They used superheated wire to shape the foam. The team was convinced that one cannot simply sell just foam balls on their own. So they had developed a wide range of indoor games which used the balls, including basketball, dodgeball, and indoor baseball, just to name a few. After what I presume were many, many more games of how hard can I hit Jerry from accounting without HR getting involved, Later, Geyer and team traveled to East Longmeadow, Massachusetts to see Mel Taft, future senior VP of research and development at Milton Bradley. Although Milton Bradley had seen much success with Geyer's Twister, they did not want to enter the toy market seeing Geyer's new games as more toy than game. The team then went to Salem, Massachusetts to meet with Henry Simmons, head of new product development at the Parker Brothers. Again, the team received some disappointing news. Henry informed them that he had managed to convince his reluctant managers to see the product. However, they were only interested in test marketing the base product, the ball. Faced with few other options, the team agreed to share their product. No one could have expected what occurred next. First, let's pause. Sources claim that Nerf is an acronym for non-expanding recreational foam. However, this is not the case. Geyer and his team called the balls Fallsy Balls. The Parker brothers had named it the Nerf Ball, but Geyer didn't learn where the name came from until the ball hit the shelves. Someone in charge of promoting the line at Parker Brothers suggested naming it after the foam padding on roll bars on Jeeps. Off-roaders had dubbed them Nerf Bars. The name clearly stuck. The little four inch wide polyurethane, polyurethane, ugh balls exploded in popularity overnight. The little square boxes containing the world's first indoor ball sold by the millions just in the first few years. Geyer is quoted saying, who knew the world wanted a ball that wouldn't bounce? Some of the first TV commercials to feature the Nerf ball were joint ventures with General Foods Kool-Aid drink mix and had the members of the band The Monkees drinking Kool-Aid and tossing a Nerf ball. Hey, let's play ball! In the house? Sure! Hey, what are those things anyway? They're Nerf balls! Spongy foam! That doesn't hurt anything! Nerf balls! You're Nerf. Hey, so where do you get these Nerf balls from, Mickey? From Kool-Aid! Free! You send in the top of 20 packs of regular Kool-Aid or 10 packs of sugar-sweetened Kool-Aid to Kool-Aid, P.O. Box 600, Bradley, Illinois, and get a free Nerf ball! A Nerf's a Nerf. By far the best slogan I have heard in a long while accompanied the new product. Throw it indoors. You can't damage lamps or break windows. You can't hurt babies or old people. Following the success of the original Nerf Ball was the Super Nerf Ball. Honestly, I'm just including it because of the name. In 1986, Rain Geyer was inducted into Hasbro's Inventors Hall of Fame. His love of music would lead him to co-found Ren Song Music in 1986. Today, Ren Song Music has many number one singles and has won a Grammy and two CMA Song of the Year awards. Geyer struggled with dyslexia as a boy, and so in 1991, co-founded Windsor Learning, which develops and provides materials to help kids who struggle with dyslexia learn how to read. Geyer apparently is an artist. His works are featured in a few private collections. Unfortunately, I was unable to find his work online. And for whatever reason, if you were wondering where the original Nerf Ball is today, well, Geyer still has it. In author Tim Walsh's book, Timeless Toys, Geyer explains that the prototype ball acts as a Christmas ornament each year. This is not the end of the story, however. Nerf's evolution into what we know and love today won't come for another two decades. Millions of Nerf balls had been sold by the end of 1969 following their debut. A huge market of outdoor sports being played indoors had just been discovered, and it was like opening Pandora's box. The many ideas which Windsor Concepts had generated prior to sharing their ideas with Parker Brothers started to join the Nerf ball on shelves by early 19. In 1972, the Nerf Oop 
was released. It saw great success, but nowhere near the product next to it. In 1972, renowned kicker for the Minnesota Vikings, Fred Cox, while still being an active member of the team, came up with the idea of a football made to prevent leg and foot injuries for kids. He partnered with local entrepreneur John Maddox to create a football made of soft foam. They used a mold of a regulation football to create their foam football, pouring liquid foam into a mold instead of shaping it by spinning foam on a lathe, how the Nerf ball was manufactured, meant that the football had a thicker outer covering, which helped it behave more like a football. The Parker brothers ate up the idea and released the Nerf football in 1972, making the Nerf football and Nerf Oop the most memorable extensions of the Nerf sports line, both standing the test of time. It's the 1980s. High-waisted trousers, sweat wristbands, ankle boots, and awesome-looking jackets are in. What else is in? Nerf. The Parker Brothers began to really expand Nerf sports branding during the 80s. There were a plethora of indoor games made during this time. The Nerf Pool. From Parker Brothers. All the action you'd ever want from a game of pool. You can set it up and play on practically any table in the house. And never worry about scratching a thing. I can't think of anything I'd rather put away. Indoor golf. But not with Nerf Indoor Golf. Nerf Golf lets you turn your home into a nine-hole course with some of the toughest holes you can imagine. And with Nerf Golf, it's tough to make a disastrous shot because the balls are soft and safe. Nerf Indoor Golf, the nine-hole golf game with clubs you put together from Parker Brothers. Air hockey and ping pong. There were also these veggie tail looking nightmare creatures from the dark dimension. These are the Nerfle Nerf Balls. Anthropomorphic Nerf Balls with faces and jobs. I have no idea, but I would not want to pick these up. The Parker Brothers would expand the sports side of Nerf throughout the 1980s, including releasing the Nerf Indoor Baseball in 1983. It's Nerf Baseball with a power core center, solid on the inside so you can hit it a long way. Nerf in, Nerf in USA. Nerf in, Nerf in USA. Tough on the outside so it can take it. As a quick thing, I could not find any numbers on whether this was true overall, but despite Mr. Geyer believing he had broken the strict parental line of no balls in the house, my parents never let me or my siblings play with the Nerf balls in the house. Don't know if that was true in other households, but it's fine. Certainly not false advertising or anything. Meanwhile, an aerospace engineer from Atlanta, Georgia, named Lonnie Johnson, was tinkering away at a design which would revolutionize pool time fun. Everybody knows its name. The villain of most summer job lifeguards. The one. The only. Power Drencher. Yes, in 1989, Johnson had released the Power Drencher, which we would recognize today under its new name in the 1990s, the Super Soaker 50. The device used a patented air pressure system, which allowed it to propel a large sum of water out one end further and faster than anything on the market, including that one college girl who has never had alcohol before, pretending to be a volcano at her first frat party. Super Soaker would join the Nerf family line of products in 2010. It was also in 1989 when the precursor to what we recognize Nerf as being today would emerge. The first step in Nerf becoming the American military industrial complex of kid-safe weapons manufacturing and distribution. Hey! Last of all, took the concept of the original Nerf ball, a pelting device, and combined it with a tool to allow kids to hit their siblings with deadly foam force. From what I read, those who had these as kids loved them, and so the new market had been found. 
Nerf was held by Parker Brothers until control was handed over to Kenair Products sometime in the 1980s. In 1987, Tonka purchased Kenair Parker Toys, and in 1991, Tonka was bought by Hasbro. Nerf would go under the subsidiaries Odds On and throughout the 1990s and early 2000s before finally coming under complete control of Hasbro. Nerf, during this time, did not falter, however, selling over 100 million products by 1995. Nerf continued to make their outdoor to indoor sports products, including freaking fencing. A real skill. To win, you gotta knock down all these targets. Watch me demonstrate on the geek here. And go! from Parker Brothers. And this real weird four-way table tennis thing from 1996, but the Blastaball had already, if you'll allow me, got the ball rolling on a new generation of Nerf products. In 1991, Nerf introduced the Nerf Bow and Arrow, which is exactly what it says it is. Pretty basic, but very cool for any kid looking for a fantasy-style weapon which they can actually use during play. Now your heart is thumping fire as quick as you can! Nerf bow and arrow! Then, in 1992, Nerf decreased the size of the projectile again, but instead of a ball, it was a foam dart. The Nerf Sharpshooter. The Nerf Sharpshooter, a single fire, pull bar charging, plunger blaster with storage for two additional darts on top of the blaster. It used the famous suction cup darts and officially started Nerf's arsenal. Throughout the 1990s, Nerf would release more of these blasters, roughly based on the same concept. From foam darts used in things like the 250 dart blaster from 1998, to the larger arrow-like torpedoes used in the 1993 Arrow Storm, down to a blaster which took from the roots of Nerf using foam balls as projectiles, the 1994 Ripsaw, to whatever these things are. Nerf had finally found a new home in the world of toy guns. Skipping ahead a bit to 2004, saw what my generation grew up with, N-Strike. Initially starting with a set of three blasters, the Hornet AS6, Scout 93, and the Titan ASV1, they could be combined and fired simultaneously using a Unity power system. The blaster line also introduced the now infamous tactical Nerf Picatinny style rails. The line is considered to be one of Nerf's best collections of blasters, many of whose designs Nerf has continued to use to this day. The line also introduced a new dart, the nipple tip whistle dart. N no, we won't need to censor it. It's family friendly. Some honorable and very recognizable mentions include the 2004 Night Finder EX3, 2005 Maverick Rev 6, the 2006 and 2010 Long Shot and Long Strike, respectively, the 2008 Recon CS6, and the 2010 Barricade RV10. I had many of these blasters when I was a kid, and so did many of my friends. They were all around fun toys and staples of many childhoods. Nerf. Part of the N Strike line included the 2008 Vulcan Blaster, one of the largest Nerf blasters to date a 25-dart, belt-fed, electronic plunger full-auto blaster advertised to be able to fire three darts per second. The Beast ran on 6D batteries. It is a monster, baby for scale. And set at the low, low price of $50, right in time for the recession. Looking back on it now, $50 for a Nerf blaster today is a steal. No. I did not have the Vulcan. I had something far better in my opinion. The 2008 Nerf N-Strike title for the Wii. 
Yes, Nerf also tried their hand at video games, though they never forgot where they came from. Not only was this a game where you could play with all the Nerf guns up until that point, but you could ditch the controller and replace it with a round bar single fire blaster. That is one of the best combos I have ever seen. In 2009, the old slogan of It's Nerf or nothing returned, and that's probably the only reason why anyone in my generation knows about it. In 2011, Nerf began to explore different projectile shapes in the form of discs, like tiny little frisbees. Seeing these darts fly is quite satisfying. That same year, Nerf won the Boy Toy, no, not that one, of the Year Award for the N-Strike Stampede ECS. Super Soaker also received some love. The Super Soaker Shot Blast won the Outdoor Toy of the Year at the 11th Annual Toy of the Year Awards held at the American International Toy Fair in New York City. On August 1st, 2012, Nerf found diamonds once again with the release of the N-Strike Elite line. Classics returned in the form of new and improved blasters with new darts and a blue and orange color scheme. Blasters like the Rampage, Retaliator, Strong Arms, Strife, and many more hit store shelves and were instant hits, some even outliving their N-Strike counterparts. Nerf had not gone completely over the edge into feeding the supposed arms race that American children are. No, they are still quite connected to their roots. Nerf balls continue to receive updates throughout the years. In 2012, Nerf Fire Vision allowed kids to take their balls out at night for some nighttime game of fetch, I guess. 2013 was a busy year for Nerf. They released the Centurion, which featured their newest dart, the Mega Dart. These names are just so good. In February, Nerf announced their Rebel line. Released in the fall of 2013, the Rebel line was geared toward the gals. My sister had one of the early blasters, but lost interest in it as, not to brag or nothing, mine were much cooler. At the same time, Hasbro had partnered with Gramercy Products to design a line of Nerf merchandise aimed at dogs and their owners. Not literally aimed, no. These products were similar to what you would already find at a PetSmart, but look more Nerf. For Nerf's 45th anniversary, they expanded lines, improved blasters, and added exciting new features, including the first built-in blaster camera and the free play style bash ball. I don't know what that is, but it sounds great. It doesn't look appealing, but to each their own. Other Nerf lines, like the Zombie Strike line, was seeing quite a bit of success. The Zombie Strike Crossfire Bow won Best Action Toy at the 2014 UK Toy Fair. Nerf made their Modulus and Rival series, both being really cool blasters, one geared toward full customizability, the other marketed toward teens. As Obama was leaving office, Nerf decided to dip their toe into the water and test the market of drone warfare with their 2016 UV Terra Scout. I'm gonna be honest, I hadn't heard of this thing until researching for this video. I would have called it the Sibling Annoyer 3000, but that's just me. More lines would arrive in 2017 with the AccuStrike, which came with the AccuStrike rounds. Again, Nerf trying to wrangle in a larger teenage base. But the reality is, Teenagers now more than ever spend more time playing video games than playing with toys or going out with the boys. So Nerf did the next logical thing. They spent millions on partnerships with the brands who had the audience they were searching for. In 2019, Nerf partnered with the creators of the very popular game Fortnite. This would continue as they would also partner with Disney and 343 Industries. From here on, you can see Nerf continue to claw at the current and new generation. Three new lines would release in the span of just five years. In 2022, Nerf attempted to jump onto the TikTok trend bandwagon by creating a gel blaster. Other companies had been doing that for much longer than Nerf, and so the expensive and overall underwhelming blaster received mixed results. Some of the oddest decisions made by Nerf have happened quite recently. These include the release of their 2023 Nerf Elite Junior line. Like, who needed these? 
I played with regular Nerf guns as a small child. Why would I want these? Maybe I'm sounding more like a boomer. Uh, I don't know. Worse, in my opinion, is their mascot, which is the spawn of a creature of unknowable nightmares mixed with a drunk, coked-up director at a stock brokerage. Murf the Nerfoid. Honestly, I thought the Nerfles were bad, but this... This isn't right. This needs Jesus. Nerf hasn't always been sunny times and terrible mascot designs. It has had its fair share of controversies. In 2008, Nerf was forced to recall their N-Strike Recon Blaster after 46 reports of kids sustaining welts, bruises, and skin flaying injuries. In June of 2010, Nerf sued Busby Toys for patent violations of their Super Soaker brand. They won the suit, and Busby was banned from developing water-firing blasters. In April of 2012, in a not-so-elaborate espionage of an Australian blog, Hasbro tricked several bloggers in divulging their home addresses. This allowed Hasbro to send them all cease and desist letters. Why did this all occur? It seems our Aussie friends from down under found and leaked images of new blasters being made in China, which Nerf was going to announce later that year. For that, Hasbro brought down the hammer, to the anger of everyone who spoke out against Hasbro for what seemed like a fairly harmless move. Many, many on the internet who deal with Nerf blasters have also spoken out about the newer blaster quality. They claim that the material is cheaper, manufacturing has been made cheaper, opting to use more glue and pins rather than screws, which hinders Nerf lovers' ability to modify their blasters, the darts have not changed in years and are now the worst on the market, and that the blasters themselves have not improved in power nor distance in quite some time. Many will point to the new Nerf Elite 2.0 line as the pinnacle of Hasbro's unwillingness to develop higher quality products. Despite all this, Nerf was valued at $463 million in 2022. Trends point at a steady level of $450 to $500 million, which means Nerf has a lot of life left to live. Many more balls to shoot at children. All right, all right, that's enough. Everybody, uh, that's it. Everybody go home. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for watching this whole video and thanks for getting to this point. If you like this video or the content that I make, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps the channel grow and it helps me make more content for you. I really enjoyed making this as a fun little quick thing. And if you want me to continue finding these kind of obscure or weird histories, go ahead and let me know if there are any that you would like to see. Thank you so much, and I guess that's sort of it. Okay, bye.